Good evening. Um, welcome and thank you very much for joining us for this webinar, Taking Steps Towards Net Zero, um, which will present some of the practical tools and steps you can take within your uh, protected cropping business to reduce your carbon footprint. I hope you can all see and hear me okay. Um, I am Natalie Key, Knowledge Exchange Manager for Horticulture at AHDB, and I will be hosting this evening. Before we kick off, um, I just want to run through. Oh, unfortunately, my are my slides moving. Nope. Interesting. Sorry about this. So I just want to run through some housekeeping elements and also the order of play for the webinar. So um, for information, attendees are muted, but you can ask questions via the questions box um, on the right hand side of your screen, um, which is indicated there by the red arrow. I will read these questions at the end of the webinar um, and it would be really helpful if you could indicate who they're for. Any questions we don't get to, um, we'll keep and try to answer um, after the webinar. And if you do have any questions once we're finished, please do email them to me on natalie.key at ahdb.org.uk. Basis and Enroso points are available for the webinar, so please complete the forms that you can download um, from the handouts box, which is indicated by the green arrow, um, and send them to Maya, whose email uh, is listed on the form. The webinars recorded and made available on our events archive um, and our horticulture YouTube channel, so you can access the content after the event. Um, if you have any problems during the webinar, please do um, email them to me if you can't highlight them via the questions box. So for the order of play, we'll start off with John Swain from NFU Energy, um, who will provide an introduction uh, to the webinar and also the GrowSafe project, which is a AHB, an AHDB funded uh, project with the goal of helping farmers and growers save energy. We'll then hear from Erin, also from NFU Energy, who will discuss uh, carbon footprint calculations, what systems you can use, what information needs to be gathered and the merits of using different carbon footprinting tools. John will then um, talk about how to start reducing your carbon footprint, highlighting the challenges and the first steps to take to reduce your energy emissions. We'll finish off the webinar with any questions that have been submitted. Um, we'll do our best to keep to time and should be finished off by about 7.30. So for now, I will uh, pass over to John to start us off. Thank you, John. Thank you, Natalie. Good evening, everybody. And hopefully you can see my uh, my presentation screen. We can. So, yes. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you, Natalie. <clears throat> so, yeah, I'm going to just take you through the sort of, sort of brief introductions um, and talk about uh, net zero in the context of protected horticulture and, uh, and our energy consumption. Before we do that, I think it's important just to talk about Grow Save. Um, we're providing this program under the, the Grow Save initiative. So Grow Save is a program that is funded by AHDB, uh, horticulture, but also a couple of other sectors in AHDB to provide energy uh, and uh, information about reducing people's carbon footprint in this case, but reducing energy emissions and uh, improving people's productivity and performance through uh, climate control, et cetera. Um, Growth Save had a bit of a change over the last couple of years. Many of you will know we used to operate a, uh, a Growth Save website and training courses and the like. Um, those things are, are still available through the AHDB website rather than as a standalone website and our training course program, etc. We're hoping we'll resume in sort of a physical sense as soon as uh, COVID restrictions ease, um, but we're trying to provide as many of the materials as we would normally provide. Um, but yeah, if you've got any questions about GrowSave or interested in the program, please start off with uh, ahdb growsave um, or come and talk to me or Natalie about it. Okay, so let's get started then. Um, so what is net zero? Over the last couple of years, I guess I've rarely heard a day where net zero isn't mentioned. 
Um, and yet quite a few people don't necessarily know what net zero means. So apologies if I'm preaching to the converted and everyone knows what net zero means, but it's useful to start off with some, maybe a, an understanding and a definition of what net zero actually means. So imagine you're, you have a bathtub full of CO2, imagine that's the atmosphere. Um, and into that, carbon dioxide is, is going, and out of that, carbon dioxide is being soaked up, is being taken out. So you have a system, a carbon dioxide system. If we put more um, carbon dioxide in it, then our emissions are increasing. We're increasing the level of CO2 that we have. If we're taking CO2, carbon dioxide, out of it, then we're decreasing the level of CO2 that we've got in the system. What we mean by net zero is when we're in, in some form of balance. So the amount of carbon dioxide emissions we're putting into the system is equal to the removal actions or the amount of carbon dioxide that we're taking out of the system. And hence we achieve net zero. And like all good balances, it's far easier to achieve a balance when you're putting smaller amounts in because you have to take smaller amounts out. And that's really the principle upon uh, thinking about carbon footprint reductions, carbon emissions and achieving net zero is how do we reduce those emissions first before we have to take actions to offset the emissions that we are producing ourselves. One of the questions is people you know, quite often ask is, well, why can't we just completely remove our emissions altogether and then we wouldn't need to take any uh, offset actions? And that would be termed growth zero. Um, so that's effectively when we're saying that we don't have any carbon emissions. And for many people, horticulture included, that's almost an unattainable um, uh, end game because if you're going to have some form of level of activity, then the chances are you're going to have some amount of carbon emissions. So at some point, we're all going to have to take some form of offset actions to reduce the CO2 out of the system. Um, but if we can reduce the amount that we're putting into the system as a starting point, then so much the better. As we say, over the last couple of years, um, net zero has been talked about a lot and in both formal and informal terms. We are uh, committed to net zero, um, actually enshrined in law to achieve net zero as a, as a, as a country on the whole by 2050. Um, and then since that time, um, various groups and organizations and individuals and companies are all pledging to get to net zero by a certain time frame or a certain date. So NFU has a, a name that agriculture as a whole gets to net zero by 2040. Some retailers have decided they're going to set some different boundaries and get to, in this case, being queued, gets to net zero electricity. So emissions from its electricity by 2030. And indeed, if you wanted to do, then you can pledge to do something similar yourself. Um, the NFU has a net zero pledge map where some farms have gone on to make those commitments to say, we will also try and achieve net zero in a particular time frame, in this case, by 2040. And so there's quite a lot of talk about it. And of course, we need to underpin that talk by some action. In um, assessing what net zero means for agriculture, we had to uh, assess what the, the, the size of the problem was. And over here we have a graph that shows what the emission sources are made up of that um, give our total greenhouse gas emissions for UK agriculture. Um, and on the right hand side, we have those proposed mitigation actions to remove um, that problem to reduce our, carb uh, our carbon emissions and also to um, create those offset actions so that we can achieve net zero in agriculture as a whole. Within protected horticulture, uh, we mostly sit within these carbon dioxide um, emissions up the top here in this uh, sort of dark red bar, largely because we don't have livestock um, and we don't have significant quantities of land with land actions that produce nitrous oxide. And so the size of our problem in, in specifically in protected horticulture, but also in horticulture as a whole, is mostly in this top part of the, of the bar. And conversely, when we talk about the actions needed to take to mitigate those emissions, to reduce those emissions, we're talking about, in effect, productivity improvements, so um, efficiencies, improvements in the way that we do things, reductions in our uh, emissions at source, rather than taking on sequestration actions, i.e. actions to, to soak those emissions up. 
And yeah, that leads us to question, what is it that we can influence in the business that we have? Um, and we're talking here specifically about our inputs. Um, and uh, it comes no surprise to most of you that one of our most significant inputs is in energy. Uh, and that, that is something that I'm going to talk a little bit um, about later on after Erin has sort of discussed the measures, uh, the, the measurement systems that we could employ. So just to sort of reiterate where we see um, uh, the journey to net zero um, going and how we, we sort of take those journeys. Yeah, we call this footsteps towards net zero and it, uh, it's what you need to start with here. Yeah, how do you get there and uh, what are those actions that you're likely to take? And so our first footsteps, so we always say this in virtually everything that we do, not just net zero is, do you understand what you're doing at the moment? Have you measured it? Consequently, once you've done that, you can then start to work out where you can be more efficient, how you can reduce your inputs. And finally, in the net zero system, we then talk about we've been as efficient as we can be. We've reduced our inputs to as little as they are. We now going to need to start to offset our emissions to sequester some carbon or to look for alternative ways of doing what we're doing. And this is the area that we're going to start with. And Erin's going to talk about that now. So I'll hand you over to Erin um, to discuss about the measurement systems that we can employ. Thank you, John. Um, hopefully you can all see my slides okay. Um, yeah, we can so, see you. Excellent, thank you. Um, so my name is Erin Rusbridge. Um, for the past 18 months or so, um, I've been working predominantly on um, greenhouse gas emissions and carbon footprint calculations um, for several clients sort of throughout agriculture and horticulture um, at NFU Energy. Um, so I've been yeah, very close to the ground on this sort of thing. And I'm just going to give today a brief introduction on carbon footprint calculations and go through some definitions and different methods that you might use and then some of the available tools that you've got. So to start off with, to answer the question on what is a carbon footprint, um, you first sort of need some background information on it. So to start off with, I'm going to talk about the GHG protocol. Um, so this is a piece of um, guidance that is a, the most widely used and comprehensive international standard. Um, the fact that it's the most widely used means that it's not likely going to be replaced um, because when you start talking about benchmarking and comparing figures between sites, um, if everybody's using the same standards, it's much simpler to, to compare yourself to other sites or compare yourself to your own site after you've made some improvements down the line. Um, so the methodology that's outlined in the GHG protocol um, is all based on IPCC methodology. Um, it outlines lots of different greenhouse gases. Um, the main three, like John mentioned earlier, being carbon dioxide, methane and nitrogen. Um, and then each of those, along with the other greenhouse gases, which are mainly refrigerants, um, have their global warming potential or GWP associated with them. Um, and that's basically to turn everything into a carbon equivalent. Um, so in terms of quantifying the amount of carbon that your activities are emitting, um, the GHG protocol splits those activities into three scopes. So you've got scope one is all of your direct emissions. Um, so this is going to capture everything um, that happens on site that emits greenhouse gases. Um, so the most obvious in that is um, combustion of fuels. Um, that could be any kind of fuel, whether it's natural gas or diesel or biomass, um, whatever it is. And that's stationary combustion in sort of a boiler or CHP, as well as mobile combustion. Um, so if you've got any machinery or any sort of forklifts running on diesel or something, um, you've all of that is in your scope one, directly emitted um, greenhouse gas. Scope two is your indirect emissions from energy. So this is mostly going to be captured in electricity import. So somewhere up the line, um, some fuel has been burnt, some emissions have been produced in order to generate that electricity. Um, and then the, your scope two is sort of quantifying how much emissions are associated with the energy that you use, that you import. So electricity, like I mentioned, or if you're importing heat or steam directly, um, if you've got a private wire or if you're part of a heat network, then you might be 
importing heat, um, that's all captured within scope two. So then scope three leaves you with sort of everything else. Um, the most obvious thing to talk about is water. Um, so you've got upstream and downstream emissions associated with your water usage. Um, all of the any treatments or um, pumping that's happened to get the water onto your site, um, all of those upstream emissions um, are included within scope three. And then you use the water and downstream, that's going to go to um, any water treatment or sewage, um, and that, that's going to have emissions associated with it as well. Um, it's also anything else that's not energy. Um, so any construction materials that you use, um, any packaging upstream and downstream, um, any transport. So that can be your employee transport, um, business transport, or it could be um, HGVs your, when you're um, taking your product to wherever it is on your supply chain that's going to. Um, all of that is captured within scope three as well. Um, which is split into upstream and downstream. It's often useful to um, set a boundary on your calculation um, so that you don't include all of scope three because it can very quickly get out of hand in um, how much of your activities um, you're going to include within a calculation. And it's it's almost like a diminishing returns of you can spend a very long time trying to quantify every single action, every single emission source that's that's associated with your business. Um, but when you get into sort of some of the the activities that have a very little impact on the final figure, um, you end up spending a very long time going through collecting all of the data, doing the calculations to get a very little gain at the end. Um, so it's important to keep that in mind going forward. Um, but now you know that the how the GHG protocol sort of set out, um, I can give you some definitions. So a carbon footprint is a life cycle analysis of a product. Um, so that's not often what people mean when they say carbon footprint, um, but under the GHG protocol, that's a definition. Um, so if you wanted to have a calculation, say for um, kilos of CO2 equivalent per kilo of produce, um, all the way from sort of cradle to grave, full life cycle analysis, all three scopes, upstream and downstream, um, that would be a carbon footprint. What people often actually mean when they talk about carbon footprinting is something more like a GHG inventory. Um, and that's a little bit less sort of rigid in its structure. Um, on a broad sense, it's um, an emissions inventory of an organization. And you can sort of set those boundaries um, however you like to, whether that's something like an operational boundary, operation of your organization, so the activities that you can influence, or whether it's um, something more like a stakeholding thing. So if you have several sites um, that you yeah, only wanted to include the emissions from a certain site because you have sort of ownership over that site, then you could do it that way instead. Um, so a GHG inventory is sort of what I'm going to refer to it as going forwards because that's makes a bit more sense. Um, so like I said earlier, talking about setting a boundary for your calculation, um, this can be very easy. The first thing you really need to do is to ask yourself, why is it that you're doing a GHG inventory or even a carbon footprint? Um, if it's some kind of obligation, um, something like SECR, um, the EU ETS, um, these um, Normally, they'll give you some kind of boundary already. Um, it will be for those two that I mentioned, SECR and EVTS. Um, they ask for scopes one and two. They do encourage you to do some scope three, um, but there is no obligation to do them. So the majority of companies don't. Um, and then, yeah, if it's part of because you're um, part of a supply chain for some of the supermarkets that are starting to do these, um, starting to ask their their suppliers to do carbon footprinting or GHG inventories, um, then they're most likely either going to give you a tool that you have to use or they're going to give you some guidance on which scopes you need to do, where you need to set your boundaries. Um, 
if you don't have any obligation, so if it's a if it's marketing reasons, then the best things to sort of focus on are relevance, completeness, consistency, accuracy, and transparency. Um, that's just going to give you the most sort of defensible position. If it is for marketing reasons, then you want to be able to sort of prove that you've done as much as you can and not get caught out if somebody sort of digs into your calculations and asks you, okay, well, why are you not including water, for example? If you've got a large amount of irrigation that happens on your in your business, then you could, yeah, that could be a, a big hole that could easily be put in it. Um, and then lastly, um, for personal interest, if it's something that you yourself feel as though it's you need to be doing something for net zero I mean, there's been so much talk about it recently um everybody probably feels as though they should be doing something um without the first two points on this list then it's difficult to sort of justify doing that um but again it, it comes back to the same thing it's it's making sure that you're doing yeah enough so that it's a defensible position that you find yourself in um, so then we'll move on to how to do um, how to calculate your greenhouse gas emissions. So there's two types of data that are needed for doing this. Um, your activity data, so that's going to be um, what it is you're doing, whether that is um, combusting fuels, um, applying fertilizers, um, using electricity, any of this kind of things. Once you've got all of your activity data, um, and that will be in meters cubed, kilowatt hours, quantities. Um, then you also need emissions factors. Um, so there are emissions factors that are um, produced UK specific yearly um, by Bayes, um, but those are scopes one and two for the majority of fuels. Um, and then it's got some scopes three as well, um, specifically around transport it's got, and then some constructed materials, it does have water in there as well. So there are some available online, but depending on your situation um, you may not have those kind of emissions factors um, or potentially there are some suppliers that have done their own um, carbon accounting and they might be able to if you're buying um, certain packaging or um, certain materials off of them then they might have an emissions factor that's associated with their product um, so it might be worth asking if you do go down that road um, so Alternatively to doing it yourself, um, there are some calculators that are available. Um, it was around January last year that um, the NFU did an exercise where they had um, some people from each of the sectors do a carbon calculation for their farm um, using various different online tools because there are a multitude of them available um, to sort of try and highlight which ones were the most appropriate for use, um, had the most sort of robust science backing them. Um, and it was these three that were found to be the sort of the ones that the NFU um, would recommend to use. So that's the Cool Farm tool, um, which has it's free to use for farmers um, for up to five calculations. Um, and then after you've done those five calculations, you have to join their um, Cool Farm Alliance. Um, in order to have a sort of unlimited amount of calculations. Um, but the Cool Farm Alliance is a sort of, yeah, widely subscribed to um, company. It's got uh, PepsiCo, Tesco, Nestle. Um, it's got some big names sort of attached to it that are um, signed up to this Cool Farm Alliance and they're sort of part of developing this tool. Um, so it's a, it is a good one to use. It is product specific. So you could do a carbon footprint using this tool, um, or you could yeah, have each of your crops um, have a specific um, carbon account related to it, um, but it's not able to do a whole farm um, calculation. So it does fall short a little bit there. Um, the farm carbon toolkit is sort of a bit of a for farmers by farmers um, calculator. It's it's free to use completely um, and it only does whole farm calculations um, this one's really good for certain um, sectors and that is the sort of theme that runs throughout is that each of these tools are good to use for some sectors um, 
unfortunately none of them are particularly good to use for protected horticulture um a lot of them some of them will have a um a, a part an inputs um area where you have to put in details about your soil and if you're not using soil obviously you can't put any inputs in there um and then some of them will stop you from going any further into your calculation until you fill those in so it's you can, yeah some of them you do have to sort of force to work for you um for predicted horticulture and that can be a bit of an issue um but it is possible to yeah make them work although they're not perfect um lastly agricalc um it's made by sac consulting um and again it's free to use um it's the most complex of the three so it gives you if you've got the most data the most accurate complete data um, and you want to have the most options on how to do your calculation then agricalc is probably the best one for you to use um, it has whole farm as well as product um, calculations but it is a bit more complex to use so yeah keep that in mind as well um, and like i said before none of them are perfect um, especially for protected horticulture and there's two main areas that they fall over um, we'll talk about that in a minute but if you didn't want to use one of these three um, then a manual calculation is sort of only way to go um, so like i said before you'd collect your activity data um, so if that's natural gas combustion or electricity import or whatever it is that you're doing um, you have your usage which is your quantities and then you'd find your emissions factors whether that's from bays or from a, a supplier specific and then multiply them together using those emissions factors and for each of the greenhouse gases that are outlined in um, the ghg protocol you're going to have an amount of carbon equivalent emissions um, sum those up at the end and you've got your total carbon or yeah total carbon equivalent ghg emissions for that activity um, that's simple to do for most of the steps um, certainly most of scope one all of scope two and then some of scope three can be done in that way um, the two areas that are a bit more complicated which are the two areas where the available tools sort of fall over a little bit um, is nitrogen emissions and chp um, so first of all talk a bit about nitrogen um, when calculating nitrogen um, the reason why these calculators aren't so good is because when you're applying nitrogen to your protected horticultural crops it's going to produce ghg emissions very differently to how an arable enterprise putting nitrogen onto their field is going to produce emissions um, you're going to have fewer um, indirect emissions through um, leaching runoff and um, volatilization so that's something that is not accounted for in any of the calculators so if you were to use one then it could end up sort of inflating the amount of emissions that are associated with the nitrogen you use um, so that's something to be careful of so doing it yourself um, there's ipcc um, which is the what the ghg protocol is based on um, I, IPCC has equations for calculating your direct and your indirect emissions um, from nitrogen applications. So those are split into three tiers depending just on the completeness and the accuracy of your data. Um, so the simplest one, the first tier of calculations is relatively simple. Um, there are equations there, you, you find your data and there's tables of some default data to use. Um, multiply them through and it, it'll um, calculate your direct and indirect emissions um, and then on top of that you've got um, your upstream emissions so if you're applying synthetic fertilizer to your land or to your crop then there's going to be um, emissions associated upstream with the production of that and um, if you're using something um, organic um, then those upstream emissions might be less um, but again that that comes down to either finding emissions factors that are available um, online for defaults or um, talking to your supplier and getting your supplier specific emissions factors um, so the other area that i talked about which is probably the the most relevant to a lot of you guys 
um, is CHP. So the difficulty with CHP um, is that often you're running it for three different reasons. Um, you could be running it for electricity, um, you could be running it for heat, or you could be running it for CO2, or any mixture of those three together. And the way that each of these calculators um, calculates your um, emissions associated with CHP use is not the best. Um, some of them just don't do it at all. Um, so yeah, if you are if you do go down the route of using a calculator, then sort of make sure you yeah pay attention, make yeah check how your calculator that you are using is um, is approaching CHP, especially electricity export, um, because that should be giving you a um, offset of your carbon because you're exporting electricity. Um, so there are three ways for you to approach electricity export and um, calculating that and quantifying it. Um, those are past 2050 um, using ISCC methodology or um, just removing it, um, which is there is a tool available, a spreadsheet um, available that IPCC produced, which can help you do that one. So past 2050, um, it essentially gives you a, um, it nets off the electricity that you export by giving you an offset that's got an emissions factor equal to the electricity grid. So I spoke before about um, scope two, your electricity import is going to have a grid emissions factor. Um, so if you're exporting it and you're using past 2050 methodology, then you'll get an offset equal to the grid emissions factor. Um, which it sort of makes sense, um, but it's, yeah, none of these are perfect, but they're the sort of three options that you can go for. Um, ISCC is International Sustainability and Carbon Certification, um, and the way that they do it um, is it's a little bit more complicated, but they it, it bases your, instead of giving you the standard grid um, electricity emissions factor, it will give you a different emissions factor or calculate a different emissions, emissions factor for you based on the type of fuel that you're burning in your CHP or to produce that electricity. Um, and then the final one, the um, IPCC tool will use the efficiency of your engine to um, basically net off the gas that you've used to produce that electricity that you've exported. Um, so those are the three ways of doing it. Um, they're each very similar in their final results, um, but yeah, the particularly past 2050 is the sort of the lowest resolution of the three calculations. Um, and if you're doing a historic calculation, if you're doing sort of a um, even two years ago, 2018 baseline figure, then you'd need to be careful because the grid emissions factor in 2018 was much higher than the grid emissions factor in 2020. So if you're gaining an offset that's equal to the grid emissions factor, then your carbon footprint today could be much higher than your carbon footprint two years ago, um, despite having the same electricity usage purely because of the way that um, this, this, um, this calculation is performed. Um, so that's that's all I've got um, on my slides. A brief introduction on um, carbon footprinting, what to be aware of, um, different tools available. So I'll pass back to John now. Thanks, Erin. Yeah, yes. thank you, Erin. And hopefully you'll be back with me. So yeah, uh, Erin has uh, sort of comprehensively gone through the the measurement part and uh, hopefully some of the understanding. And yeah, you know, there are some very complicated parts of the of the understanding which we certainly can't achieve in this webinar. And actually, there are people that make a career out of some of these bits. So uh, d d don't be dismayed if some of these things are are difficult to grasp or or you want to look into some of these things into more detail. As we say. Yeah, understanding and measuring is is an important part. Um, your carbon footprint, yeah, you know, as a number, can only take you so far. 
um, and actually doing something about it, reducing your inputs, being more efficient is, is, is the next step along that journey. And we're going to talk a little bit about that now and mostly in the context of energy, um, being as we are energy specialists, but yeah, as we are in protected horticulture, quite dominant in our carbon footprints with, with our energy consumption. So I make no apology for being energy specific over the next sort of 15, 20 minutes or so. As Erin said, everything has a carbon emissions factor associated with it, usually expressed in kilograms of carbon equivalent per unit of productivity. And when you sum them up, you usually get lots and lots of kilograms, so it's quite easy to assimilate that in terms of tonnes. And so just a, a little bit of uh, visualisation, what is a tonne of carbon equivalent to in terms of the emissions that produce it? And so, yes, uh, some, some facts and figures down the right hand side, four megawatts of lighting on for an hour, uh, six megawatts of a gas boiler for less than an hour, driving 700 miles in an HGV, a leakage of, of some refrigerant, uh, sorry, creation of some refrigerant or the application of some ammonium nitrate. Um, yeah, th those are some ideas, thoughts and processes. That, yeah, how do you uh, equate a tonne of carbon to what you're, what, what you're doing? When we think about our inputs, and you know, we just talked a little bit about what might be our inputs just on the, on the previous slide. Um, as Erin says, identifying them, what are the quantities of them, setting our boundaries um, and determine what those, uh, uh, those emissions are, give you the, the remit to create that footprint, be it a productivity footprint or be it a uh, whole farm type footprint. And then we're asking ourselves, are they significant compared to our other inputs and uh, what are the alternatives? One of those significant um, inputs, you know, here they are, energy, fertilizers, pesticides, plastics, growing media, water wastes, et cetera, et cetera. These are all emission sources um, that you'll encounter within your businesses. A principle that's widely been used over the you know, many, many years is this virtuous circle, this reduce, reuse, recycle. Uh, and you know, the circular economy, there's another set of buzzwords, is, is all about you know, reducing what we do, reducing our impact on the on the environment by um, being efficient and uh, making sure that we waste less. Uh, and the principles uphold here still. So let's talk about energy then. Erin um, alluded to this, um, the grid emissions factor. So the amount of CO2, in this case, grams of carbon dioxide emitted per kilowatt hour of electricity um, that the grid provides you has been dropping quite considerably over time. Um, and you know, back in the, the heady days of the 90s, it was very high in the 2000s, sort of about 90, the late 90s into the 2010s, it sort of stabilized around the high 400s. Um, but really, it's been coming down quite rapidly since then. Um, and maybe we start to see a slight tail off um, now in terms of the, the bottoming out of that curve. But uh, yeah, the grid emissions factor is reducing. That's largely come from stopping the burning of coal um, and latterly of the increasing uh, use of renewable energy. That has a great story really from um, our point of view because if we use electricity and pretty much all of us do, then the amount of emissions that we can associate with the use of that electricity will be smaller. And Erin alluded to it in, in slightly different terms earlier around CHP, but direct use of mains electricity is naturally reducing our carbon footprint now compared to what it was three, four, five, ten years or so ago. And that's set to continue. And when you look at the projections, which National Grid do as to what's going to happen over the next 30 years or so towards 2050, um, we are projected to have ever more renewable electricity and sometimes non-renewable, but non-carbon emitting electricity within the makeup of our, uh, of our electricity supply to, uh, to individuals. Yeah, up to 76% of electricity comes from renewables. And when you look at the percentage of non-carbon sources, it's even, it's even higher. So you end up really around about the eight, nine percent of fossil fuel generated electricity in our mix in, uh, in 28 years, 30 years time. Just sort of relating that to, to a horticultural site for a second, you know, I, I created as part of this, uh, this webinar, my uh, a five hectare nursery based around what it might use electrically and what it might use in terms of heat. 
Um, so a standard uh, nursery not using very much electricity compared to heat, but still using a considerable amount. Um, its carbon um, footprint in terms of its electricity consumption, its greenhouse gas emissions in terms of its uh, electricity emissions, about half now what they were um, eight, uh, eight or nine, ten years or so ago. And if we look out towards 2050, they could be significantly less than that. So about 5% of what they were in the, around about 2010. And that's great news for, for, for calculating your greenhouse gas emissions and looking forward to seeing where you, where you might be going. Unfortunately, there's slightly less good news on the heating fuel side. And of course, these dominate what we do um, in terms of our energy use, as well as energy dominating what we do in terms of our carbon emissions. But yeah, it's less good news. And that's predominantly because our heating fuels are based around gas and oil, and they've got an inherent amount of carbon associated with them because their molecules are built up of carbon. Um, so we have uh, around about 190 to 220 grams of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour. And that's unlikely to change much. It certainly won't change much if you carry on burning diesel, unless you move whole scale to biodiesel. If you carry on burning kerosene or move whole scale to um, some sort of bio equivalent, then yes, of course, you are changing your carbon emissions. But if you stick with diesel, if you stick with kerosene, then its carbon will be exactly the same today as it was 10 years ago, and it will be 10 years in the future. Where that might change, however, is in the natural gas network, where natural gas is diluted by the addition of biogas, of biomethane, um, and potential hydrogen blends. You know, up to maybe 20% hydrogen blended into the natural gas network means that we will start to reduce the carbon emissions of the gas supplied to, uh, to, to you as individuals. And then it, that sort of relates to us in that if we're going to make a really big difference in decarbonizing our heat, we need to start to think of technological change rather than necessarily waiting for the natural gas network to decarbonize itself the way that the natural, uh, sorry, the way that the electricity network has decarbonized. And then we need to think in terms of maybe CHP with the pitfalls that Darren's discussed earlier, but um, maybe other technologies such as heat pumps and biomass and other technologies to come in the future that um, uh, reduce our impact on our heating systems quite considerably in carbon terms. Just to give you an example of decarbonisation at work with heat pumps, yeah, if you take a kilowatt hour of heat from the gas network that's got um, carbon associated with it, put it through a, an efficient boiler or an inefficient boiler, then you're looking at emitting that amount of carbon per kilowatt hour of, uh, of heat that you've used. Where things like heat pumps work is that yeah, if you've got a, an efficiency of four, a COP of four or five, then three to four units of that heat that you're delivering to your greenhouse system has come from a renewable source, i.e. the ground or water or air. And so the amount of um, carbon emissions associated with delivering that heat is, is a fifth or a quarter of, um, of, of the total. And that means you can divide your grid electricity emissions by four or by five to end up with your value that says what are the carbon emissions associated with that heat and they're considerably less you know 40 grams per kilowatt hour instead of 200 plus grams per kilowatt hour in terms of the uh, the fossil fuel combustion alternatives and clearly as the grid electricity decarbonizes further then those emissions are set to fall further um, and so it's no surprise that uh, heat pumps are things that people are getting very excited about um, in terms of uh, their potential to reduce the carbon emissions of the UK. Just to give you an example of what that looks like, again, um, here is my uh, five hectare. In this case, I'm, I'm going to badger unlit greenhouse. Um, so it's got sort of standard ancillary use electricity consumption as well as uh, as heating use around around the 400 uh, kilowatt hours per square meter per year level and we can see the way that our carbon footprint can be very different depending on the types of technology that we employ and make some significant reductions when we start to apply things like heat pumps and biomass boilers because of their inherent carbon uh, neutral or carbon reduction potential in terms of maybe a lit crop of glass out of tomatoes um, then similar sorts of trends can be seen, although the numbers are significantly different. Um, and that's because we've got considerably more energy use in that, uh, in that area of glasshouse than we would have in an, in, in an unlit version. 
Um, and of course, our potential is less when we get to um, yeah, heat pumps and, and biomass, and limited, especially in the edible sector, by we're saying actually we can't necessarily have a wholly supplied heat pump um, system for our heating or a biomass supplied um, system for our heating because we don't have any carbon dioxide associated with it. And there is the paradox there that uh, we need the CO2 for our, our aerial enrichment and maybe necessarily a whole scale move is unpalatable in that sense until we can sort out our supply of carbon dioxide. However, nonetheless, um, government, the, uh, the policy makers aren't necessarily worrying about our individual circumstances and our use of CO2, no matter how much we tell them. And so that policy drives are towards the electrification of heat um, and mostly around disincentivizing the use of fossil fuels in, in any sense, let alone combustion. And they're doing that, you know, softly, softly, um, and then before you know it, you blink and it turns out into a, a quite a considerable increase in charges, yeah, increasing climate change levy charges. That's happened, you know, 2006, I started getting involved in CCL, and those charges have crept up and up and up since then. We started this year with a green gas levy, sort of um, putting onto gas for the first time a non-commodity charge that is there to pay for um, putting biomethane into the grid. Um, and that shows a trend towards taxing out fossil fuel users to pay for the, the, the green alternatives. And then there's an aspiration to apply carbon price. Um, so see, really, that is a fine, a, a penalty for using more polluting fuels in carbon terms. Some of these are balanced out on the, uh, on the disincentive side by positive drivers, and these start to make the economic decisions for a move away from carbon emission, uh, emitting um, heating systems slightly more palatable by supporting them. And we've all heard or understood the RHI, Renewable Heat Incentive, popularised the use of biomass boilers in horticulture and around the ornamental sector specifically. Um, but yeah, the green gas support scheme is going to help put more biomethane into the grid. Some small scale renewable heat grants for smaller boilers, smaller heat pumps, uh, and potentially maybe sort of providing tax breaks, tax benefits um, in a new climate change agreement, climate change levy scheme in the future to try and uh, ensure that people become efficient, sign up to efficiency measures in return for some benefit around their, the, the costs of their fuels. And just to re reinforce that even further, um, announced in the autumn was the 10-point plan, um, and you can see exactly where this is going and why we need to take this really seriously, because yeah, 40 gigawatts of offshore wind is going to make a massive difference to our electricity network and its decarbonisation, whereas having 5 gigawatts of hydrogen compared to the, the numbers of, uh, or the amount of energy we use for heating is barely a blip in the ocean. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's a really important thing to understand that uh, electrification of heat, whilst not very palatable in protected horticulture at the moment, is somewhere that we're going to need to start thinking very seriously about and solving those other ancillary problems that it causes. Just for completeness, the rest of the 10-point plan um, starts to become a little bit more conceptual. Um, I think, interestingly, I know it's gone one, two, three, four, five, and then one, two, three, four, five again. But uh, apologies for that. But this one here, carbon capture of 10 million tonnes, how are we going to get that out of the atmosphere? Are we going to do that by tree planting? Are we going to do that by technological carbon capture and then locking it up in some form of underground mess store or, or so on? Uh, and yeah, reinforced by that tree planting that's going to affect agriculture as a whole. Uh, so, as I say, decarbonising heat um, is the future for us, not always around heat pumps, but uh, clearly that is a big part of the, uh, uh, of the plan at governmental level, and we need to rise to that challenge. Um, just to reinforce that point, we're, we're seeing this in, in horticulture that stands at the moment, some very large greenhouses being built over in East Anglia that don't necessarily use the ground or the groundwater. These are currently going to harvest heat out of industrial processes, in this case, the treatment of water in a sewage plant. And those are the sorts of things that we need to start to think about. Where can we site our glasses? Where can we get our heat from? Can we align ourselves to other heat sources and make better use of them? Um, in order that we can be efficient um, and uh, we can keep our costs low. I still think biomass has a really important part to play 
in uh, the decarbonizing of our heating systems in horticulture um, and uh, you know, bioenergy generally has sort of been overlooked in the last sets of policy rounds and I think there's, there's moves that uh, that's going to become um, higher up the agenda as we go forward over the next three to five years. As we say, don't forget the carbon dioxide enrichment challenge for our, uh, enriching our aerial environment. And one of the trade-offs, I guess, that we're going to have of all these ideas and techniques of capturing carbon out of the atmosphere is it could actually allow us to get new sources of pure CO2 to, to put into our glass houses to, under, uh, to offset the fact that we've got less carbon coming from our combustion. Um, so yeah, interesting to see the packages of funding specifically around carbon capture and storage technologies and direct air capture is here. There are um, reference sites over in, on the continent um, where they are taking CO2 directly out of the atmosphere and putting it into a glass house. Just sort of coming to the end then and talking about uh, other sort of energy things, I think it would be remiss of me not to mention refrigeration um, in this because that is a big part of our energy consumption for some people. Um, but we need to talk about refrigerants in that context and uh, why refrigerants and refrigeration is, is really quite an important part of, uh, of, of achieving net zero. And Erin talked about global warming potential. So this is the effect that you have by um, releasing some of these um, liquids or gases into the atmosphere compared to the effect that carbon has. And it's really interesting to see how very much more polluting they are in carbon terms. Uh, refrigerants 404a, you lease a, a kilo of that, it's going to have you know nearly 3.9 tonnes worth of effect on the atmosphere. Um, and then, yeah, not all refrigerants are the same, and clearly you can see the moves to less polluting alternatives, and this is the driver towards making sure that we have the right of refrigerant mix in our in our uh, cooling systems. Yeah, CO2 can be used as a refrigerant, as can ammonia, and they have very low carbon emissions associated with them. The one thing, however, um, and Erin talked about the mix and making sure that you you don't have consequential actions. Um, and here is one, you know, don't forget about how you're making these refrigerants as well as how you're going to get rid of them and maybe the increase in consumption in energy terms that they're going to create um, in, in their use. So you can't just think about them in terms of the, the, their potential leakage when you're trying to quantify the effect of moving from one thing to another. Okay, um, so yeah, we're coming to the end of, of our time um, and we've just sort of had a whistle stop tour through some of the things that you might be able to do in the energy side of thing. And of course, this is a much bigger uh, jigsaw puzzle than just energy when we, when we come down to our greenhouse gas emissions as a whole. But I'd sort of redraw my virtuous circle here and uh, think about how we reuse our resources, how we make sure that we keep our consumption of those low and sort of the impact of renewable energy um, and keep that in mind as you go forward in doing your carbon footprints and your greenhouse gas calculations. As we say, summing it all up, energy is an important uh, CO2 emission to tackle. Uh, we're going to see this, re this real dominance of renewable electricity um, at grid levels, which can have a, a massive benefit to us when we're using mains electricity or can sort of slightly you know, be a bittersweet pill to swallow when it comes to uh, how we treat our combined heat and power systems and the offset can, uh, emissions that we're putting into the grid. Uh, greenhouse heating is moving towards heat pump. I think this is a, an inevitable move. I think this is not necessarily going to happen hugely quickly. It's not like it's going to be a revolution over the next year or so, but I think over the next five to ten years we are going to see that uh, sort of dominance of uh, heat pump type systems within glass houses uh, um, coming to the fore. And of course we need to find those alternative sources of CO2 um, as we reduce the amount of gas that we burn and also as we um, start to put other forms of gas into the network. And yeah, I suppose I say this virtually every um, talk I do, efficiency is really important. Yeah, let's reduce what we do in terms of our emissions at source before we then start to tackle the offsets of, of that. So efficiency is a really important uh, part of this equation and shouldn't be overlooked. And it has been overlooked over the last few years with uh, feed-in tariffs and renewable heat incentive to the detriment of some of the efficiency measures that we could have taken. Okay, um, and 
sort of leads me neatly on into the, the, the question time. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and uh, Erin and uh, Natalie will join me back again and uh, with, with Thank a you, panel John. question session. Thanks very much, John. Um, so we do have a few questions that have come in. Um, the first one's quite long, so bear with me. Um, okay. <laughs> are there any plans to make a bespoke international protected crops carbon footprint standard as producers import slash importers um, need to compare between the GB and European production. For instance, one box scheme, box scheme in the UK, um, box scheme company, sorry, in the UK have exported some of their organic tomato production to Spain based on calculations from Exeter University, suggesting which suggest a lowest carbon footprint growing there and importing back to the UK. Presumably, they used a protected crops model, which was bespoke for that purpose. If not, then companies can pick and choose which model to use for the best outcome, um, which may vary in each country. So be misleading. And, you know, the challenges around that, I think he's referring to. Yeah. Um... Erin, I'm going to hand over to you in a second to, to talk about the... the the greenhouse gas protocol for as, as an underpinning of those calculations. I, th I think protected horticulture does need a particular type of calculator. Um, I, I think it's kind of been left out there in the wilds as, as other farming systems have, have, have dominated that uh, that agenda. And maybe are easier to get hold of, maybe easier to to, to, to grasp. Um, but when you're talking about international standards, we do have a standard that underpins those calculations. And should that box scheme have done their calculation in the way that they say they've done it, or the University of Exeter have done it, they will have adhered to the greenhouse gas protocol in doing it for the very reasons that Erin outlined in terms of being transparent and being able to explain yourself when, when questions are asked, why you've come up with the answers that you've come up with. Erin, do you want to expand on that? Yeah, yeah. So. It is um, at the moment the reason why there's not a sort of international um, calculator or, or not necessarily standard because there is a standard in the GHG protocol and sort of IPCC methodology, um, but there's not a given um, number of scopes or boundaries that any company has to calculate um, because there isn't any sort of legislative um, obligation to do it. So, yeah, I mean, like I said, with um, calculating your emissions from CHP, there's a couple of different ways that you can do it. Um, IPCC methodology does have, like I said, a couple of tiers of calculations that you can do depending on your completeness and your accuracy of your data. Um, so it could be that <clears throat> a certain site could you could choose to do a calculation using one of the less complicated um, calculations that IPCC have sort of laid out um, and that could produce an outcome that is perhaps more favorable for their situation. Um, it's something definitely worth talking about because there isn't any um, yeah, legislative guidance out there on how to do these calculations to a certain standard. Um, yeah, it's at the moment <laughs> The, the short answer is there isn't, um, but that's certainly something that needs to be, you know, part of the conversation going forward. If, if I can just come back in on on that, I think the short answer to the, I said, we're not aware of any calculation calculators that that are being built um, to handle that in that specific way. It does come down to what you're, why are you doing a carbon footprint calculation or a greenhouse gas calculation, and in that particular case um uh, they're doing it for a bit of marketing uh, and they're doing it because they want to make sure that they um, are comfortable with the decisions that they're making so they're using it as a decision support tool for where they get their vegetables from um, what i think is really important in all of this net zero thing um, is to make sure that we make some action um, and we can get very paralyzed with how we measure things and whether people are measuring things in the right way or doing the, in, in the way that we would have done them and whether we've got the same measurement systems. But if that stops us making efficiencies, if that stops us reducing our own emissions, then we've really gone nowhere. Um, and, and I think it's important that whatever measurement system you choose, 
you would take action off the back of that to reduce your emissions and make that positive step to, to that net zero ambition. Thank you very much. Um, we've had quite a few questions in, so I don't think we're going to be able to cover them all right now, but we will get to them one way or another. Um, uh, should we add injected CO2 um, to the list? And if so, what scope does this fall under? Erin? Yeah, um, so injected CO2 is another thing that's not captured by the calculators um, because obviously an amount of the CO2 that you're putting into your glasshouse is going to be absorbed by those plants and essentially sequestered in the same way that a tree is going to capture carbon. Um, that's going to turn into sugar, into your fruits or vegetables, and it's going to be ultimately um, captured. And there isn't currently an option to include that in any of the calculators. Um, and it's not a very easy thing to include um, without sort of measuring the amount of, um, yeah, sugars is probably the best thing to go on. Um, the amount of sugars that are within your crop sort of from um, the start to the end. That would give you an idea on how much of the carbon you've put in is then released to atmosphere through your vents. Um, that would be just the carbon that you've injected and then goes out, that's scope one, because it's a direct emission. Um, the Something to sort of make note of when you're talking about pure CO2 is where has it come from? Um, there's going to be upstream emissions associated with the production of that liquid CO2 and then the transport to your site. Um, so those are scope three upstream emissions, but then the actual injection and release of that CO2 is going to be scope one. Right. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, can you please clarify how growing media is contributing to the carbon footprint is it extraction or transport hmm. uh, i would say <laughs> all of it uh yeah. abstraction yeah especially if that's that's coming from the ground in one way or another composting actions if it's compost you know the the, the manufacture of of uh, you know substrates rock walls all those sorts of things um, they all have energy associated with those actions, if not some sort of release of, uh, of CO2 in, in their production directly, um, and of course transport. So yeah, all of those actions have some form, and don't forget disposal as well. Um, you know, where is it going? Is it going into landfill? Is it going into a recycling plant that's going to turn it into something else? Um, mm. yeah, all, all of those things will have consequential CO2 emissions associated with them. Um, I think I might just do one more question. There are quite a few, um, so I'm I'm hoping that you'll be happy to answer those if I send them through to you after the Absolutely. fact. Absolutely. Yeah, and we will then um, we'll share those um, with with the people that have asked them, but also um, with the webinar once it's published. Um, so the last question is: Does gas from AD plants have a lower emissions factor? Yes. So it, it does depend on what feedstocks you've used. Um, so the simplest way to sort of um, understand it, if if you've got um, biogas AD, um, if you're familiar with it under the RHI, um, there's sustainability reporting where each of your feedstocks, you have to quantify the amount of um, carbon equivalent emissions that each of those feedstocks is producing anyway. Um, so if you're buying that biogas, then that's something that you can, you should be able to get hold of from your supplier, um, or yeah, it's it is something that is fairly easily calculated. And um, if it's completely an, an entirely waste biogas um, production plant that you're using, then it'll have a zero emissions factor. Um, but in general, unless it's a crop that has used an awful lot of nitrogen emissions, um, that's that's the the main contributor to um, energy crop feedstock into the, into a yeah, digester is going to be nitrogen, um, unless it's a crop that's used uh, sort of a lot of nitrogen, a lot of energy intensive crop, um, it's pretty much always going to be lower than um, natural gas. Great, thank you very much. Um, so I'll just 
quickly wrap up. As I said, thank you for all your questions. Um, we will we will get back to you with them um, after we finish the webinar. So so don't worry about that. Um, Thank you very much for listening, everyone, and thank you so much to Erin um, and John for their contributions, really appreciated. If there are further questions on top of the ones we have remaining, uh, please do email them to me uh, on natalie.key at ahdb.org.uk. Um, and don't forget to uh, submit for your basis on Enroso points if you collect them and send them to maya.tetcher at ahdb.org.uk. Um, my screen's gone funny sorry about that um as as i said the webinar has been recorded so if you want to catch up on any detail um you will be able to do that after the fact and it will be shared on our um event archive and ahtb horticulture youtube channel there are also uh, plenty of other horticulture webinars coming up um lunchtime thursday next week I'll be running a webinar on biofungicide use in protected edible cropping, which may be of interest. And you can register for that webinar and um, the others via the AHDB events page. So I think with that, um, thank you again for listening and thank you to our speakers. And um, I hope you have a, a really good evening. Goodbye. <laughs>